Greetings and welcome back to 303 and Junior English. We turn now in your hymnals to page 982, 983 and following, the John Hersey text, Hiroshima. Now, we'll only be looking at a small number of lines from this classic text, Hiroshima. Let's talk for a few moments about the author. You have a picture of him there in the lower right corner on 982, and you have a quote there, there is one sacred rule of journalism, the writer must not invent. That is an interesting idea given the current political and, of course, journalistic milieu we live in today with what we call uh, fake news or alternate news, both sides, left and right, accusing the other of inventing stories and the like. Let's read a little bit about Hersey. You can see his dates there from 1914 to 1993. It's significant. He's born the year that the Great War, World War I, begins. Let's read. John Hersey was born in China to American missionary parents. The family lived in China until Hersey was 10 years old when they returned to the United States. In 1936, Hersey graduated from Yale University and became a foreign correspondent in East Asia, Italy, and the Soviet Union. So we have another example of a writer who starts out in journalism. Let's write that one down. His experiences working as a journalist served as the premise for his 25 books and his countless essays and articles. Hersey combined a profound moral sensibility with the highest artistry. His novels and essays not only examine the moral implications of the major political and historical events of his day, they do so with high literary grace. In 1945, Hersey won a Pulitzer Prize for his novel, A Bell for, Arn for Adnar Ad Ad Adarno, in which an American major discovers the human dignity of the Italian villagers who were his enemies in World War II. The next heading, the atomic bomb. Th during the 1940s, Hersey traveled to China and Japan as a correspondent for the New Yorker and Time magazines. He also used these visits to gather material for his most famous and acclaimed book, Hiroshima, 1946. Let's write down the date, 1946, so you can see how close this book was published to the conclusion of the Second War. A shocking, graphic description of the devastation caused by the atomic bomb that was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima near the end of World War II. This remarkable report, which tells the vivid and detailed stories of victims of the bombing, was first published as a four-part article in The New Yorker. And again, just one more time, let's put it in your notes. The importance of The New Yorker in American letters. We should point this out, and of course, later we would even say now, today, The New Yorker is so significant for international letters um, as well. Uh, writers of all persuasions seek to try and find their words printed in the covers of The New Yorker magazine. You can, by the way, Google New Yorker, and you can see an online version as well, which I would recommend to you especially for those of you who are also into comics and stuff. Uh, the four-part article in The New Yorker was published, by the way, August 31 of 1946. William Shawn, then editor of The New Yorker, made the unprecedented decision to bump all of the magazine's other editorial content in order to publish Hersey's article. The final heading, Stories of Inhumanity and Courage. In 1950, Hersey published the novel The Wall, which tells of the extinction of the Warsaw Ghetto by the Germans during World War II. Hersey's later works include A Single Pebble, 56, The War Lover, uh, 59, The Child Buyer, 1960, The Algiers Motel Incident, 68, The Writer's Craft, 1974, Blues, 1987, and Fling and Other Stories, 1990. Let's turn now to... Uh, uh, page 982 in the literary analysis. Let's write this down in 2B really quickly. The theme is the central idea or insight of a work of literature, what we call obviously 2A. Many nonfiction works present explicitly stated central themes while most works of fiction, poetry, and drama express implied themes. The meaning is conveyed through details, characters, events, descriptions, literary devices. However, some nonfiction works, and let's write this down in 2B. This is a nonfiction work. In other words, this is held to be a true event that's being reported. Some nonfiction works use the same literary techniques as fiction, including an applied or suggested theme. Both of these selections, one of a work of journalism and the other a poem, we'll get to it later, The Death of the Volter at Gunner, express implied themes about war, comparing literary texts. An author's perspective is the point of view from which he or she writes. This perspective may be objective and impersonal, subjective and personal, or a mixture of both. Notice two bullet points here. With an objective perspective, the narrator reports events without obvious emotion or bias. Hersey, 100,000 people were killed by the atomic bomb. 
With a subjective principle, the narrator expresses feelings about the events. Jarrell, I woke the black feck in the nightmare fires. As you read these selections about World War II, we'll be looking at two. The first is Hiroshima, the second is the death of the Baltic Gunner later. Compare how the authors mix objectivity and subjectivity in surprising and effective ways. We want to obviously be analyzing as well the writer's political assumptions. That's your reading strategy. And please note your five vocab words at the conclusion uh, at the bottom of page 982. Let's turn to 985 quickly now. And uh, let's just see the, how, how, what we're going to read. Go ahead and scan really quickly the, um, the uh, pages. And please do note some of the photographs that are provided for you. This is a reading notice that we will finish on page 995. Okay? Let's go to uh, background information real quickly. In August 1945, <coughs> American President Harry Truman was faced with a terrible decision. The world had been at war for six years. Germany had surrendered in May, but Japan refused to give up. The United States had just finished developing an atomic bomb. President Truman had to decide whether or not to use this new technology to bring an end to the war. On August 6th, Truman ordered that the atomic bomb be dropped on the, on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. Let's write that down. August 6th. Three days later, another bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. These two bombs killed more than 200 thousand people and force the Japanese surrender. Like so many events of World War II, the atomic bomb gave the world a new horror as John Hersey so carefully documents in this selection. Okay. Now, it's funny to me how sometimes students of mine will read a number like what you just read. 200,000 people died in the dropping of these two bombs. Um, and, and they kind of go, oh, yeah, right. And it doesn't mean anything to them. But play this game with me real quickly. Grab your phone. Go ahead. Let's do this. Grab your phone and go to your calculator. Go ahead. I challenge you to do this. You live in a town of 5,000 people. Am I right? So take 200,000 and divide it by 5. And give me an answer. 40,000. 200,000 divided by 5,000. That's the number of people, right, that you have living in your town. 200,000 divided by 5,000 gives you an answer of what? How many? Go ahead, tell us, say it out loud. How many Warlands died in two days? with two bombs. Forty Warlands dead. Forty! Whoa! I mean, if we were to lose in our town, can we, be, can we be fair about this? If we were to lose in our town four people, am I right or am I right? right? If we were to have four people dead in our town at one day, that would be a big deal. Would you agree with me? That would be a that would be like, you know, there would be there would be like a lot of sadness. There would be a lot of people walking around going, what's wrong? Right? Can you imagine losing the entire town of Orland in one day? I mean, everybody in the town dead. That is not what we're saying here. Forty Warlands died in two days from two bombs dropped. Whoa. Now that I've got your attention, let's turn to the text itself. What Hersey's going to do now is just simply tell us about the experience of the day the bomb was dropped. All we're going to do now is just read along at level one. All we're doing is just taking notes about, quite literally, what it is that he tells us about. We have professional reader. Just follow along and let's be moved by the, by the, the incredible writing and the story to follow. Here we go. From Hiroshima, by John Hersey. At exactly 15 minutes past 8 in the morning on August 6th, 1945, Japanese time, at the moment when the atomic bomb flashed above Hiroshima, Miss Toshiko Sasaki, a clerk in the personnel department of the East Asia Tin Works, had just sat down at her place in the plant office and was turning her head to speak to the girl at the next desk. 
At that same moment, Dr. Masakazu Fuji was settling down, cross-legged, to read the Osaka Asahi on the porch of his private hospital, overhanging one of the seven deltae rivers which divide Hiroshima. Mrs. Atsuya Rakamura, a tailor's widow, stood by the window of her kitchen, watching a neighbor tearing down his house because it lay in the path of an air raid defense fire lane. And the Reverend Mr. Kiyoshi Tanimoto, pastor of the Hiroshima Methodist Church, paused at the door of a rich man's house in Koi, the city's western suburb, and prepared to unload a handcart full of things he had evacuated from town in fear of the massive B-29 raid which everyone expected Hiroshima to suffer. A hundred thousand people were killed by the atomic bomb, and these four were among the survivors. They still wonder why they lived when so many others died. Each of them counts many small items of chance or volition, a step taken in time, a decision to go indoors, catching one streetcar instead of the next that spared him. And now, each knows that in the act of survival, he lived a dozen lives and saw more death than he ever thought he would see. At the time, none of them knew anything. The Reverend Mr. Tanimoto got up. Let's pause for just a second and recognize what we're into now. Notice, very simple, we're going to introduce ourselves to four Japanese people who were living there in, in <coughs> around, around Hiroshima, and we're going to hear their story. I, inexplicably, they survived. When how many died? Did you see that line? A hundred thousand people. We could do our mathematics again, right, and say, whoa, 20 Warlands in one day, gone. Gone. From the dropping of one weapon. Incredible. Incredible. Now we're going to obviously kind of break down each of these stories, and at level one, all you want to do is just write down now the name of the individual who are going to be, you're getting ready obviously for the exam, you're going to have exam questions over this reading, right? And you want to write down the name of the individual, and you want to have some sense then of kind of each one of these four people's stories, okay? Here we go. Now again, we're not reading obviously the entire text uh, by John Hersey called Hiroshima, we're just reading <coughs> cuttings out of it, right? Here we go up at five o'clock that morning. He was alone in the parsonage because for some time his wife had been commuting with their year-old baby to spend nights with a friend in Ushida, a suburb to the north. Of all the important cities of Japan, only two, Kyoto and Hiroshima, had not been visited in strength by Bisan, or Mr. B, as the Japanese, with a mixture of respect and unhappy familiarity, called the B-29. And Mr. Tanimoto, like all his neighbors and friends, was almost sick with anxiety. He had heard uncomfortably detailed accounts of mass raids on Kyori, Iwakuni, Tokuyama, and other nearby towns. He was sure Hiroshima's turn would come soon. He had slept badly the night before because there had been several air raid warnings Hiroshima had been getting such warnings almost every night for weeks, for at that time, the B-29s were using Lake Biwa, northeast of Hiroshima, as a rendezvous point. And no matter what city the Americans planned to hit, the super fortresses streamed in over the coast near Hiroshima. The frequency of the warning and the continued abstinence of Mr. B with respect to Hiroshima had made its citizens jittery. A rumor was going around that the Americans were saving something special for the city. Let's, pa Mr. Let's pause for just a moment and look at your sidebar there on page 986. You see a picture of a B-29 bomber. Read it with me. The Second World War saw major advances in the technology of mechanized warfare, warfare that relied heavily on machines. The B-29 Super Fortress bomber that Hersey mentions was an aircraft capable of long-range, heavy bombing runs. It was used frequently against Japan during 1944-1945. Firebomb B-29 raids against industrial cities in Japan totaled nearly 7,000 flights and dropped 
41,600 tons of bombs. Uh, and then you connect to the literature. In what way would having more information about the B-29 bomber increase Mr. Tanemoto's anxiety level? And let's just pause for a moment and write this down at level one. It's clear from all of the study that Hersey and others have done that there was great anxiety in and around Hiroshima about the notion that there was about to be a major attack. Now, of course, why this attack would come on this city had a lot to do with the fact that this was one of the major industrial centers and this was the attempt, again, to try to end the war. Let's continue with our study. Tanimoto was a small man, quick to talk, laugh, and cry. He wore his black hair parted in the middle and rather long. The prominence of the frontal bones just above his eyebrows and the smallness of his mustache, mouth, and chin gave him a strange old young look, boyish and yet wise, weak and yet fiery. He moved nervously and fast, but with a restraint which suggested that he is a cautious, thoughtful man. He showed indeed just those qualities in the uneasy days before the bomb fell. Mr. Tanimoto had been carrying all the portable things from his church in the close-packed residential district called Nagaragawa to a house that belonged to a rayon manufacturer in Koi, two miles from the center of town. The rayon man, a Mr. Matsui, had opened his then unoccupied estate to a large number of his friends and acquaintances so that they might evacuate whatever they wished to a safe distance from the probable target area. Mr. Tanimoto had had no difficulty in moving chairs, hymnals, Bibles, altar gear, and church records by pushcart himself. But the organ console and an upright piano required some aid. A friend of his named Matsuo had, the day before, helped him get the piano out to Koi. In return, he had promised this day to assist Mr. Matsuo in hauling out a daughter's belongings. That is why he had risen so early. Mr. Tanimoto cooked his own breakfast. He felt awfully tired. The effort of moving the piano the day before, a sleepless night, weeks of worry and unbalanced diet, the cares of his parish, all combined to make him feel hardly adequate to the new day's work. There was another thing, too. Mr. Tanimoto had studied theology at Emory College in Atlanta, Georgia. He had graduated in 1940. He spoke excellent English. He dressed in American clothes. He had corresponded with many American friends right up to the time the war began. And among a people obsessed with a fear of being spied upon, perhaps almost obsessed himself, he found himself growing increasingly uneasy. The police had questioned him several times, and just a few days before, he had heard that an influential acquaintance, a Mr. Tanaka, a retired officer of the Toyo Kisen Kaisha steamship line, an anti-Christian, a man famous in Hiroshima for his showy philanthropies and notorious for his personal tyrannies, had been telling people that Tanimoto should not be trusted. In compensation, to show himself publicly a good Japanese, Mr. Tanimoto had taken on the chairmanship of his local Tonarigumi, or neighborhood association. And to his other duties and concerns, this position had added the business of organizing air raid defense for about 20 families. Before six o'clock that morning, Mr. Tanimoto started for Mr. Matsuo's house. There, he found that their burden was to be a tansu, a large Japanese cabinet full of clothing and household goods. The two men set out. The morning was perfectly clear and so warm that the day promised to be uncomfortable. A few minutes after they started, the air raid siren went off, a minute-long blast that warned of approaching planes, but indicated to the people of Hiroshima only a slight degree of danger since it sounded every morning at this time, when an American weather plane came over. The two men pulled and pushed the handcart through the city streets. Hiroshima was a fan-shaped city, 
lying mostly on the six islands formed by the seven estuarial rivers that branch out from the Ota River. Its main commercial and residential districts, covering about four square miles in the center of the city, contained three quarters of its population, which had been reduced by several evacuation programs from a wartime peak of 380,000 to about 245,000. Factories and other residential districts or suburbs lay compactly around the edges of the city. To the south were the docks, an airport, and the island-studded inland sea. A rim of mountains runs around the other three sides of the delta. Mr. Tanimoto and Mr. Matsuo took their way through the shopping center, already full of people, and across two of the rivers to the sloping streets of Koi, and up them to the outskirts and foothills. As they started up a valley away from the tight ranked houses, the all clear sounded. The Japanese radar operators, detecting only three planes, supposed that they comprised a reconnaissance. Pushing the handcart up to the rayon man's house was tiring, and the men, after they had maneuvered their load into the driveway and to the front steps, paused to rest a while. They stood with a wing of the house between them and the city. Like most homes in this part of Japan, the house consisted of a wooden frame and wooden walls supporting a heavy tile roof. Its front hall, packed with rolls of bedding and clothing, looked like a cool cave full of fat cushions. Opposite the house, to the right of the front door, there was a large, finicky rock garden. There was no sound of planes. The morning was still. The place was cool and pleasant. Page 988. Then a tremendous flash of light cut across the sky. Mr. Tanimo.